Well, hello there. I'm David, and this is the core frame for my four foot studio scale Millennium Falcon. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, hmm, I've seen that before. Nope. While this looks similar to the frame that you saw in the very first video, it's actually completely new, redesigned and reprinted from scratch since that first video. In fact, to be fair, it's my third and a half new frame. So why three and a half? Well, mistakes were made. This frame is built of multiple parts. We have the central hub, sometimes that I call the barrel. We have these ribs or spokes that come off that hub. They look a little bit like the ribs in an airplane wing. And then we have the waistband, which is made up in quarters and printed in quarters. Finally, we have the mandibles. I needed to print big parts. And at the time of purchase, this print bed was the largest on the market for commercial grade 3D printers. Many of the smaller FDM printers come with the Z axis, the up and down axis, already pre-installed. So that access is square right out of the box. However, because of the size of this printer, there was going to be, how would they say, some assembly required. My test print was this Benchy, and while it looked great, it is too small to show the problem I would eventually run into. As I was assembling my very first printed components, I realized that some of the dimensions were not quite right and some of the parts were a little bit obscured. Nothing was assembling as I had designed it in my 3D modeler. I couldn't figure out why until I started evaluating my printer. What had I done wrong? Well, what I discovered is when I assembled this, I didn't make my Z axis perfectly perpendicular to the print bed. So as the object was printing, it was skewing slightly forward. That meant that none of my parts were printed square. And when you assemble big parts into a bigger thing, it ends up not square. And so that was 100% my fault for not checking square before I did any prints. 3D printers vibrate and vibration loosens nuts and screws. So now checking for a square Z axis and checking for loose fasteners is part of my pre-printing routine. It's something I encourage everybody to do before printing anything. And the hits just kept on coming. The second frame that I printed had a bit of a meltdown, quite literally. All of these parts are glued together with five minute epoxy. And while the odor and smell of epoxy doesn't really bother me at all, I had been using it quite a lot that day and just decided to put it outside so it could cure. That was a mistake. An hour later, I went to check on it and realized I'd left it in the direct sunlight. Oops. The whole rear half had melted and warped beyond repair. So tech tip, do not leave PLA out in direct sunlight at high noon. This is the old core that you saw in the first video. And after I had reprinted this rear section, I thought I was going to be good to go. Well, no. It was a couple of weeks later that I realized, yep, I'd screwed it up again. When you look at photo references of the Falcon sidewalls, you will see that the details are cut off here and here. When you measure the distance between the two cuts on the full-size sidewall master, you end up with an overall height of approximately 60 millimeters. But when I measured my sidewalls, they were over 68 millimeters. Well, sh So, back to my trusty Tandy TRS-80 color computer to load up Blender. This will take just a second. I do all my 3D work in Blender, and it's one of my more indispensable tools. As I was adjusting things for accuracy, I also took additional time to refine the frame's overall design, making changes I felt were required after assembling the previous ones. For sake of interest, the introduction animation I used for these videos was also done in Blender. Then another month on the printer. 
as they only have one FPM printer and these are large prints, it takes a while. I had considered buying a second FDM printer, but I don't have anywhere to put it. And once this core is finished, I'm really not sure what I would do with it. So after all of that, and after the mandible frames were also reprinted, I'm essentially back to where I was at the start of the very first video. Only this time, the side walls are the correct height and the core outside diameter is also more accurate. I know that the mistake was only eight millimeters, and I'm very sure that most people would have lived with that, but I certainly couldn't. To me, for this, eight millimeters might as well have been eight kilometers. It just would not have held up to any level of scrutiny. Sure, it was a lot of wasted time and more importantly, wasted material, but I will sleep better knowing that I'm building this to be the most accurate that I can make it. So I thought this would be a good time to probably mention a couple of the things that I've had to outsource for fabrication to help me along with this build. The first one is the construction stand, or at least part of the construction stand. This orange bit here is just an off the shelf Amazon engine stand. And I'm not the first one to use an engine stand. I think most people building the studio scale Falcon are using one of these orange engine stands. The part that is unique to my build is this bit here. Uh, I created the drawings for this and had it fabricated by a company in Belleville, Ontario called the Iron Rights. And they did a really fantastic job. It's steel and certainly won't bend under the weight of the model. This is exactly what I want. The other parts that I had to have fabricated are the tops and covers of the mandibles. These are three millimeter acrylic, and they were laser cut for me by a company in Trenton, Ontario called Contrast Media. And they did a fantastic job. When they first saw these, when they were first uh, fabricated, they weren't quite sure what they were. So we had a great little conversation. They were very eager to learn what it was that I was going to be doing with these. So thanks again to both Contrast Media and the Iron Rights for helping me out with this project. And for sake of interest, I pay for these things out of pocket as none of my videos are sponsored. Well, that's about it for this rather shortish video, and I hope you had fun learning about the mistakes that I made along the way. They certainly weren't funny then, but they're funny now, and now I have some interesting stories to tell. I don't know what my next video is going to be about, so I suppose you and I will be surprised together. So until then, thanks for watching.